Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration and collaboration creates community and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. Well, well, welcome to another edition of Face to Face. Uh, today we have a guest uh, calling in, or I'm calling her, all the way from uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, it's a long way away, but we have a great connection, and her name is Ola Mohajer, and uh, thanks for joining us today, Ola. Thanks for having me, David. Uh, you're, 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 you're welcome. I look forward to our conversation. Ola's been working on an initiative uh, for the last little while called The Art of Islam. Uh, theartofislam.com, T-H-E-A-R-T-O-F-I-S-L-A-M.com. Check out the website. I think you're going to find some pretty interesting stuff going on there, um, clearly related to art and uh, uh, photography and painting and, and, and so on. But I think there's a little more going on here than meets the eye, and that's what we're we're here today to talk to, to you about, Ola. Ola, what, what is exactly uh, is The Art of Islam all about? Well, the art of Islam has, I would say, a two-point mission when I, when I first, I mean, started conceptualizing it. And the first part is to make Islamic art accessible and affordable to anyone who wants to buy it in a really, really easy way. Um, and then secondly, it's also meant to be a platform for artists to be empowered to sell their own work and reap the profits of their work as opposed to... Um, Maybe what generally what artists do and what I've done is go in coffee shops and so on or or galleries if you get lucky enough, in which case you lose some of the profits there to the gallery. So it's to provide opportunity for artists um, to profit from their work and then also to bring Islamic art um, to a more accessible platform to people across Canada and really North America. So so you you actually were uh, were born in the Middle East but you grew up in is it Calgary or Win- Winnipeg or Calgary Calgary okay so you spent most of your life in Canada is that right That's right So so do you see um, this the art of Islam um, moving out beyond sort of Canadian and or North American borders and kind of uh, you know globally providing art to people or or do you really kind of hope that it's going to educate folks uh, sort of where you know your home turf as it were well I think I think like if I'm allowed to dream yeah, yeah. I would love for it to be a global initiative um, because even though it started out as something that was meant to just you know create opportunity for artists and then make the art more accessible it's blossomed into something that's a lot larger than that and that is like essentially educating people or making people more comfortable with islam or islamic art or islamic types of art so um, i would love for that to be something that goes beyond canada and the u.s um, you just you make a comment. I, I was reading an article uh, that uh, was posted recently, or relatively recently, based on a CBC posting on theliteral.com. It's a, a blog of some kind uh, titled uh, "Islamic Art Stirring Waves in Canada." Is I mean, you know, you you talk about uh, the art itself, and you mention, you know, one of the things you really enjoy is getting into conversations with people about Islam and 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 and, and folks' questions and and so on. And so you're, it's almost like you're creating space for a dialogue, for a conversation, and I think that really intrigues me. Is, I mean, is that something really necessary? I mean, is, is, is Islamic art that troubling to people, or, or, or do you see it as a, it's something that we, as Canadians, just haven't been, you know, uh, aware of? I would say that it actually um, is what maybe the opposite of troubling is, which is beautiful, I guess. So mm-hmm. people, when they've seen the art in the past, when it's been in public places, they've said, wow, this is so beautiful. I love the colors. I love the geometric patterns. Where's this photo from? Da, da, da. And they're asking all these questions about um, the beauty they see in the photos or the paintings. And then they learn that, oh, this is like Islamically inspired. So it kind of, the dialogue opens that way. And then really gets them 
well, when it, whenever they speak to me anyway, um, really gets them to kind of open up about other questions they might have about Islam. And because they're seeing a face of Islam, whether it's in a painting or in a photograph, at that moment, that's really positive. So starting off on that note um, has been really kind of interesting to see because then people then start to ask the questions that they're so worried about asking mm. most of the time um, that might have the more like negative stereotypes around Islam that are more well known, let's say. And I want to provide, like I'm always open to providing that opportunity for people to ask me whatever they like. So when I do get in conversations with people, I'm like, don't worry, you can ask me whatever questions you want. Like anything that you've ever thought of asking about Islam or not sure about or something that you thought was wrong or whatever, feel free to, you know, shoot the questions my way and I'm happy to answer. So it always starts off really positive and it always ends off really positive too. Do you find there's a profound misunderstanding in, in I mean, in the West, uh, I guess is a pretty big question, but maybe even in your hometown where you went to school um, and, and as you've sort of moved out, I know you're in Zimbabwe working with the UN now and, and probably experiencing it on a whole other level, but what about what about here at home? I really like that you said in the West because I think, I mean, now especially that I'm, that I've traveled, you know, I'm living in Africa and I've traveled to some other parts of Africa and other parts of the globe. I find that Islam has more negative connotations in the West, in my experience. Whereas, like living in Zimbabwe now, I feel like I can, because I wear a hijab or a veil or headscarf, you mm -hmm. can say any of the three, they're all okay, um, of how you refer to it. So, here in Zimbabwe, I don't feel like like I don't, I don't feel, if I can say like Muslim, like I don't feel like people, that's all they see. Like they see me and they think Muslim. Right. Whereas in Canada um, and the West, generally feel like as soon as I, you know, walk into a room, it's like Muslim. Some groups in the West have a way to go in terms of seeing the more positive side of Islam, which I mean, I don't even know if it's a side. I think all that people see is the negativity that um, is reported on about Islam and terrorism and Islamic fundamentalists and so on. But there's like so much more to Islam that is just like terrorism is really, or these negative connotations that are associated with Islam. It's really just, I don't even want to say, it's such a small part of the faith and it has nothing to do with the majority of Muslims in the world. And in fact, it should be mentioned that those negative things affect Muslims as well, too. So it's not like it's not like it's this thing that is a, it, or at least how what I perceive is like this thing that is a threat to the West. It's a threat to Muslims. Yes. So I mean, it might be deeper than it might be deeper than you perhaps wanted to go um, about that, but. No, no, I, think, I, I yeah, you, you definitely you, have a long way to go. You, you faded out there for a little bit, unfortunately, and we'll have to edit some of that uh, back in into the into the interview. And I don't think you heard my sort of follow up, but I talked about, or maybe you did, um, oh. but I made a comment about um, a whole different level being in Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe, and 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 I've traveled a fair bit as well. And I mean, talk about a a, a cross cultural eye opening epiphany, you know, when when you go into another culture and, 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 and there's just all these aha moments if you keep your eyes open. So so there you are in Zimbabwe and you say it's a different experience, so complete different set of expectations and assumptions, in other words, uh, on, on, um, that you're finding about Islam in, in, in other cultures. For sure. I mean, it's not the first thing people see here. I'm more than just a Muslim in Zimbabwe. Like, I'm a, I'm a full person here. Except well, there are different stereotypes that are associated with me and the way I look, but they don't have to do with just being Muslim. Whereas in the West, in my jobs, throughout university, sometimes it's the first thing that people will notice and it's the first thing that they will ask me about, which is I'm okay with. Yeah, sure. I just, it's been, it's been really interesting to 
What 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 not be that. Ola, what that's really I mean, I think it's wonderful that you know, the, the phrase you said you're a full person here. I'd love to explore that a little bit more, but and and hopefully we can. But what what are some of those immediate ex, uh, and forget about expectations, but those assumptions. Um, you know, they immediately want to ask you about the faith. They want to ask you about the Quran. They want to ask you about radical Islam and so on. I mean, what are some of the more tiresome assumptions would you say or or you know what it actually sounds like you aren't tired of them you're willing to talk to anybody about anything by the sounds of it to me which is brilliant totally over and over because i think if the questions are left unanswered then that person stays with their preconceived notions and if i can like i don't know quote cure that i want to so that they don't walk around with those same stereotypes or misconceptions that they once had before they met me. So I'm totally open to doing it all day, every day. And in, I mean, honestly, in the West, sometimes that's like, I do. I was in student government, so I needed people's, you know, people to vote for me. When I'm talking to people, they want to know, like, oh, you wear a headscarf and this, like, tell me about that. I would do that all day, every day. To tell people like, hey, look, I'm just like you. Don't worry. <laughs> right. Look, I have Converse shoes and I, I speak <laughs> English and, and I go out with my male friends, yes, you know? Yes. And it's not to say that a lot of, it's it, like, it's not to say that most people think this way. Um, it's more so that there are some groups or some people, and I can't classify where they come from because they come from all types of groups, but what they have in common is that they just don't know, and there's nothing wrong with not knowing. Mm -hmm. um, because if you seek the answer, then you will know. So it's a, it's a problem that's not a problem. <laughs> How deep, uh, and maybe you're, you, you don't want to touch on this, but how deep do you think um, some of these assumptions are based on racism or are they just based on this notion of, of not knowing? You know, I'm just ignorant. I just, I haven't asked the right questions. I haven't read the right books. I haven't seen the right films. I mean, isn't that what racism is, though? Is not knowing? That's what I've always thought anyway. I guess, you know, so it's interesting. I, I think... Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think, though, for me, I think there would have to be a little bit more intentionality behind it. So there has to be a little bit more, I, th I think, a little bit more choice. I just, you know, I look at my, 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 my kids, for instance, you know, young kids who may not be aware of another culture. Or, I mean, my children are growing up in a home where we, you know, we talk about lots of different cultures all the time. So that's a, a, a whole other uh, issue. But just being unaware of something, I, I, I'm not convinced would be racist. But maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Maybe it's even more grassroots than 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 you know being sort of responsible for your choices that you make. I've always seen hate as just a product of not knowing. Like you, we, like we hate. Sometimes we hate things, but we just because we don't know enough about them. Like. Like a really simple example is we automatically kill spiders. Mm -hmm. We don't know a whole lot. They kind of make us creeped out, but really they're harmless. But we hate them. But we just don't know enough about them. We don't know that they, maybe people don't know that they kill all the other insects in your home and they eat the mosquitoes and they da, 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 all whatever. They just kind of creep us out. Mm -hmm. And I think that can manifest itself in so many different ways. So if you just, at least that's what I think anyway, yeah. if you take the opportunity to learn and teach if you have something to offer, then you you kind of get rid of that, that wh whether it is racist or ignorance. I think they both stem from the same thing. Though I can, I can appreciate how you were saying that racism may be more intentional, but that's just a, to me, that's just a greater teaching challenge right. when I meet someone who's like racist or homophobic or whatever. I'll sit down and, you know, it'll be like maybe instead of a 10 minute conversation, it's a two hour conversation. Right. right. How much time are you willing to, uh, to commit to? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's excellent. Yeah. So, um, do you think we're closed minded here in Canada? Do you think we, you know, we talk about Definitely being, not. We, we talk about being pretty liberal and so on and being pretty open. You, th you, you think we are pretty, pretty open? I totally think so. I love Canada and I love Canadians and the thing that I like uh, like so much about Canada is that we're just so diverse. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we still may not know things about other cultures, but at least many of us are willing to ask or willing to try. And those who aren't, 
who need like a little bit of help coming out of their shells. People who come from the diverse cultures or diverse backgrounds can approach them and say like, hey, did you, do you want to try this like curry dish from my whatever? You wanna, right. And then you, it's just like, it, it opens, like it's just so open. So I, I don't think people are closed-minded for the most part. I think, I mean, just from my limited travels, I think Canada does really well in terms of like not, it doesn't even accept diversity. It's something that it's embraced and really valued. It's not like something that's tolerated. One of your um, one of your artists on your site uh, talks about uh, art affecting social change and inspiring others and so on, and and you just used the phrase "help coming out of you know their own shells or our own shells." We've all got shells of one kind or another. We're all in you know I guess boxed in to some degree. Do you th- do you really think art has that ability? I mean, I, I, I certainly do. I mean, I love a great poem, a great film, a great photo can make me think about and take me places, uh, think about things I, I never considered before and take me places. You know, my son said to me the other day, Dad, why do you take pictures of weird things? And and I, I, I said I didn't really have a good answer for him. And and when he what he meant was, is why why don't you take more pictures of people? Um, and, and, and I said, well, Spencer, sometimes I like to think that I'm taking a photo that someday might actually challenge somebody to to ask a new question so so I'm interested to know clearly you you think highly of art but but tell me a little bit more about its ability to be the catalyst for good for the greater good well I think I mean that's such a huge question but I think it's a biggie uh, it's I think we can agree that it definitely can be a catalyst for the greater good. And the thing about art is that you can put it somewhere and just leave it there. And then everyone gets to see it and learn from it and enjoy its beauty or enjoy the angst in it or whatever it is that's like, it's, it can be this static thing that just stays where it is and allows people who are passing by to take as much time as they want to look at it or just walk right by it, glance at it, whatever. They can choose how they want to interact with it. And depending on maybe the emotions or the message that's behind the art, they're able to do that like all day, every day, depending on how often people are getting to see the art. So, I mean, you see this like all over the world with like graffiti and, I mean, especially graffiti, actually. Hmm. Um, But now we even see it in, like, it's, I think, I mean, I was going to see it everywhere, but there isn't really much graffiti in Zimbabwe, but um, (laughs) I think think it's really powerful, and it it depends on, I guess, what the emotion is that you get when you look at the piece, or if there's this particular message, and it can relay that message over and over and over with very little effort. It wouldn't be like, for example, how I was talking about how I'm willing to talk to people all the time, anytime. I'm just one person, and so I can only interact with one person at a time. But a piece of art can interact, especially if it's like on the internet too, can interact with thousands and millions of people at once. So it even has like a stronger ability to touch the masses than one person does. So why, Ola, why do you care? Like, why the art of Islam? You're working with the UN, and, and I hope we can chat a little bit more about that in the next couple of minutes. But what is it about, uh, that, that what, what happened to you about your experience or your upbringing or whatever it is um, that, that, that planted this seed in you to say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give back as, as best I can? Well, I... Hmm. Well, for one thing... I have been creating different types of art since I was like a child. Hmm. It would always be something that I would do in my spare time. I used to love my art class. And whenever I used to have time during university to, um, like in between the thousand assignments a university (laughs) student has, but um, I would use that as like a thing to relax. So it was even something that wasn't just something that I loved. It like brought me peace. Um, And when I graduated, I had traveled, and I wanted to start something um, when I had time. And that thing was the art of Islam. And so I graduated, I just finished my traveling, and I wanted to start it. And you asked about giving back. I never saw the art of Islam 
as something that could give back, I guess. But that goes with everything that I do. Hmm. I just, I just do what I like and I love art and I love being of service to people. So what's beautiful about what you're doing. So you love being of service to people, which is a wonderful phrase, by the way, um, great title for a book or, uh, an essay or something. Um, um, is, is that you've also turned this into a social enterprise. And, um, uh, I mean, are you, are you finding that, that it's starting to pay for itself, that you're doing well with it? Is the, is it the kind of thing that actually could really start to generate some, some income for you in, in the long run? I mean, it has generated some, but like with any new business, there's so much. It's such a steep learning curve. I don't have a business background, really. So I've had to learn a lot. And it does make, it, it, it is profitable. It's not where I would like it to be. But, I mean, if I did want it to be super, super profitable, I wouldn't have my, my focus diverted. So I'm okay with it being where it is because I really want to try and bring value to the artists that actually trust me to take their work and sell it. Right. Um, and I want to, that is a big priority for me. So at this point in time, um, I'm actually working with a colleague on the Art of Islam to make it um, a little more well-known. Right now, all of our attention has just been earned and grassroots. We're not paying for any advertising or anything like that. But in order to give it that boost and give the artists who um, have joined the Art of Islam the boost in sales that they deserve, there needs to be a little more effort put into it in terms of advertising and making it a little bit more... Um, I guess a little bit more well known and right. worthy of people's dollar. So we're we're kind of coming near to the end of our time together today, but I, I, I've got a couple other questions for you if if you don't mind. Um, and one of them is a huge question. I think um, it's just hit me while you were answering that question. You know, we've probably what maybe four billion faith based people in the world: Buddhists, Christians, Jews, um, Muslims and so on. I would say even more. Maybe more, maybe more. So what are we at? Close to 7 billion now or something? Anyway, so we've got a significant amount yeah. of people in the world who are speaking of a, a faith of one kind or another. Does it bother you that we seem to have so much trouble getting on the same page? No. I think, because um, I think, I mean, to me, we are like... I mean, the way, this is, why, this is what I think anyway, I'm just going to say it exactly as I think it. I think we all have different paths that are going to the exact same thing. So to me, it doesn't seem like two different pages of a book. It just seems like two stories on one page or three mm -hmm. stories on one page. I don't know. I've always, um, in any of the religions, I, so I have a background actually in religion okay. or religious studies, but... In any of the faiths that I have studied, a lot of the foundational elements of them are really, really similar. Mm -hmm. And in some, and in some, they even borrow from like others and take from others. And some openly say, like Islam, for example, openly says, like we've taken from the Gospels and we've taken from the Torah. Mm -hmm. It's all like it's all just one big pot in the way that I see it. So I, I think we are generally. On the same page, we just have different ways of going about getting to the exact same thing. So you find yourself in in Zimbabwe working with the UN, and clearly uh, you're you're changing the world in a variety of different ways. And I think that's incredible and, and amazing. Um, and that's really what my podcast and face to face is all about. It's about incremental change. It's about planting seeds and watering those along the way. What are what are some of the issues you're facing over there? And uh, you know, you don't have to talk about Zimbabwe in general, but I'd love to hear your your sort of you know, you've got an insight there that many of us don't have into the international development sector, into the majority world. What are what are some of the bigger issues that you're that you're looking at right now, or even even um, uh, maybe, you know, and I think this is where my last question was, you know, generated from this idea that, you know, doesn't it bother you? We can't all get on the same page. I, I guess I was thinking a little bit more about the divisive nature, I suppose, of some of these issues. 
um, you know, gender injustice and 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 so on, uh, universal primary education okay. and and yeah, yeah. Could you could you speak to that for a couple minutes? Which part? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's a big question. I know. Well, yeah. just, just I think yeah. I mean, I think the 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 issues. I mean, what are some of the things? Clearly, there's some very specific issues in Zimbabwe, but what are some of the bigger? Would you say? Uh, issues that the majority world's facing right now as you know we go into the 20 you know coming into the anniversary of the millennium development goals looking at what's next uh, you, do you got any comments about that well i mean from my own perspective not from a un hat yeah, i'm sure. not wearing that just me um, I would say that I think the largest determinants of what can actually truly make a difference have to do with health care and poverty um, at almost every issue, like whether it's human trafficking or gender violence or um, like you name it, it's always linked in somehow, shape or form to poverty and health. Always. That's what I found in all of my work. So whether we're thinking about like, for example, um, what's, what are some areas that we're working on here? We're working on a lot, so I just want to pick one that's I, I bet, I bet like, well, for example, we work on HIV and AIDS, huge, huge, huge in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, clearly that's a health indicator, but it's also linked to poverty. It's also linked to motherhood. It's also linked to gender. It's just to so many like different um, education is huge. Actually, I almost want to add it to the first two education is really, really big and important in alleviating poverty and healthcare crises and so on. So I would say that to me, the largest issues and I think where we can make the most gains have to do in poverty and health and then also education um, kind of, yeah, education after that. So those link will link to all the other issues that we, that we face. And even the MDGs, when you look at them, they're associated with health and poverty. Yeah, very much so. Gender, gender, it seems, is is also a pretty pretty common thread um, throughout mm -hmm. them. Yeah, I think one of the things that has blown me away as I've uh, you know dig, dug dug digged uh, deeper into you know international development and just social change is the interconnected nature of all this stuff and you know people have said to me so david what's the one thing we got to work on the most what's the what's the you know and it's hence the question to you and i don't think there is one thing i think you know i i, I we we often try to polarize these things into either ors and 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 i don't think it's that simple i think it's these issues are pretty complicated and pretty complex and 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 but we still need to dig in and and start somewhere and uh, definitely yeah yeah listen we're we're uh we're just about out of time today and um i i i mean you know every interview ends the same way for me i feel ola like we've just started and um we barely scratched the surface i think uh we we definitely need to set up another interview down the road but thanks uh there's uh, thanks for joining us today and um yeah really appreciate your time well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this, so thank you. Oh, you're welcome. That's great. Um, uh, Ola Mohajer from uh, Zimbabwe, working with the UN uh, and working also on her own initiative, theartofislam.com. That's T-H-E-A-R-T-O-F-I-S-L-A-M.com. I think once again we've shown that there is far more going on than meets uh, the eye.